she's alive. Alive! I am Dracula. Welcome to the Manor. Uh, another wonderful evening here. We have a really great guest, um, and this guest is a part of our um, basically our 2021 celebration, the bookend celebration of the Creature series, which started with uh, 1954's Creature from the Black Lagoon. Um, you came into the Revenge of the Creature the next year, and then the year after that, we had the Creature Walks Among Us. Well. The, uh, the, the actor from the second movie, John Agar, he was the hero in that movie. He was, he made, he was like the everyman. Um, great character. Um, but you also knew John Agar from Tarantula. You knew him from Sands of Iwo Jima, a uh, classic actor. Um, and tonight, without further ado, I introduce to you someone that probably knows him better than anyone, his son, John Agar III. Hello, can you hear me? Hi. Hello, John. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing excellent, Scott. Well, welcome to the manor. I hope you like what you see so far. Awesome. I love your intro. It was amazing. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. So uh, speaking of beginnings, um, let's go back because there is actually a photo we have, and there aren't many online um, I looked, and actually the one that I was able to find was also on your Facebook. But I want to show this great oh, family portrait here. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I love that one. Look at me. I look like a little mini Angus Young. Look at that. That's me. <laughs> my dad's <laughs> holding me there. And yeah. I got this little hat on. That's amazing. That's my brother Martin and my mom Loretta with her eyes closed. God forgive her. She, she would be so pissed if she saw that. <laughs> She'd be bummed. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, uh, so what was it like, man, growing up with an A-list celebrity in some of arguably the, the best movies, the late 40s, early 50s, 60s? He did work all through, um, what, up until the mid to late 90s? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think he I think he even did some stuff even later than that. I mean, like the late 90s. I mean, he passed away in 2002. But yeah, I mean, he worked, you know, not and huge stuff, but he, I mean, he did some, yeah, he was consistently working for the majority of his life. Yeah, definitely. And, and what was it like to grow up with it? It's hard to explain. I mean, um, my father, uh, unlike other people's parents that worked at uh, aerospace or, or plumbing or, or whatever it is, my father worked as an actor. So it was a different sort of gig, you know, like uh, for years, I thought my dad was a golfer. Because if you know the film industry, you work for like a month, two, three months, or even a weekend even, or whatever, and then you're off work a lot. So that made my father be around a lot growing up, which is great mm -hmm. because, you know, we had, I had a really great little nuclear family, but my mom and dad were um, very active in all aspects of my life growing up, which is, you know, I'm really grateful for. But mm. uh, like I say, I can't, I can't speak to the fact that, I mean, I guess, listen, if my, I'd be just as proud of my father had he been a plumber, but I highly doubt that we'd be, be on a podcast talking about the septic tank that he installed in 1968, right? But so, you know what? We like to talk about things like that. So I love to hear stories. I, I told you when we originally started talking, my, my father passed away when I was 17. So I love to hear stories of positive fatherly role models. And like you said, acting is very non-traditional as far as the, the vast majority of, of people. But for him to be a good father, even having 
working, you know, been a working actor and everything, that's a wonderful sentiment as well. So I love all those little stories. Anything you want to tell us, you are open for. Well, there you go. And you just opened my, you opened my mind and my heart up to like, I can remember we, we grew up, uh, I grew up primarily, I, I grew up in, we, we lived in Studio City and uh, Encino and Burbank, but Studio City, a little town in the valley, right? Where CBS Studio is today, it was RKO. Mm. But I remember my father um, getting my brother, my brother was active, he's my older brother, Martin, he's a little older than me, about seven years, but was active in sports. My father was very athletic and sports guy. I wasn't so much, but uh, I remember my dad, here it is, John Agar, taking me out to Little League and, you know, like growing up and just taking me out in the yard and we would spend time. There was a little place in the valley on Ventura Boulevard called Flukies, which was a little hot dog joint and batting cages. And my father would take me out there and we would hang out and he would just teach me just like, you know, leave it to Beaver or something. I mean, my just, you know, my dad was not, you know, some aloof, you know, actor guy. I mean, my dad was dad. And he took me out mm. and, he, and he took a lot of time to teach me how to play baseball and how to field balls and hit them. And yeah, and he was active. He became a coach of our little league team. As a matter of fact, one of the one of my, my friends growing up was the son with another actor, an old character actor by the name of Don Knight, who was in a movie called, the, the, I believe it was the, the Immortal, but it was an English actor, did a lot of Disney stuff, but he was also a coach, and there was some famous kids. Uh, Glenn Campbell's son, Travis, was on another league, and um, it's famous producer's sons. But, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, he was there and uh, always supportive of everything I did. And uh, mm. um, he was a great dad. I mean, he was just around. He was around a little more maybe than, uh, than maybe the plumber dad might have been or mm. – you know, but, but, but again, you know, you, you know, they say youth is wasted on the young. I appreciate everything yeah. my father told me now, right? Yeah. Like, I appreciate everything I learned from him, but you know, God forbid, I didn't listen to much of it growing up, <laughs> but you know, looking yeah. back at hindsight, I'm highly grateful for it. And, uh, you know, unlike uh, a friend of mine, <laughs> You know, God for like Bill Crosby, my father didn't beat us or lock us in the closet or abuse us. He was mm. just really a great guy, man. He was really, really a good father, a good oh, friend. Man. And when he passed, a good friend, too. Like, I really yeah. like my dad. You love your parents. You love your family. You know, you can't choose them. But I really loved and became very close to him. So I can very certainly good. identify with that because I feel that myself, I, I hit the parent lottery as well. Um, I always had a hard time relating to the stories where parents were, you know, harder on their kids. I, I mean, I was really blessed to have excellent parents and it sounds like you were too. I, I love stories like that, man. Yeah. I mean, you know, my mom and dad were there. They were present for our childhood. They picked us up. From, of course, you know, when you're, when you're a kid and, and another thing, just like, just kind of frame it, you know, you got to remember, I was watching my father and. You know, when I watch my father on older films, you know, Sands of Iwo Jima and Tarantula and Revenge and so on, mm -hmm. he's younger than me. It's very strange, but I just watched a yeah. little bit of Hand of Death before we did this today. And I was mm -hmm. just watching a little bit and I just realized, you know, let's see, that was 1960, 21, 31, 20, 15. So he was like 41, 42 years old. So my father and mother had me and my brother in their late, in their early 40s. So mm -hmm. as I got a little older, they were older than most of the other parents around me. Yeah. And and even even if you're even if your parents are like in their twenties or thirties, kids are embarrassed of their parents. But you know, my father drove us to school, my mother drove us to school. Like, you know, it would be like they were very interactive in all aspects of our of our lives growing up. I'm sure my brother would concur. That, you know, dad was yeah. present and but you know, at that age you're like Oh God, you know, my dad's driving me to school and I'd hide. And now right. I realize how cool I had John Agar driving me to school. How cool is that? Oh my gosh. But, yeah. But it was just dad, but then it's just dad. Right. You know? Yeah. God, yeah. Man. We never really, my, my kids just think that I'm the dude that makes monsters and you know, my job is so easy and just, they take it for granted. So I can totally <laughs> identify with that. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And your mom was um, quite famous too, as well. She was a model, correct? 
Mom yeah, I would I would say quite famous, but yeah, my mother was uh, at one point a very highly, you know, very active, uh, regularly working model and a minor actress. She did like I think she did Springtime in the Rockies with Cesar Romero and Betty Grable. She did other parts, mm -hmm. uh, most famously, man, my mother. And, you know, I can't believe she didn't tell me this till I was like 25 years old, 30 years old. But my mom was one of the dancers in what is arguably one of the best American motion pictures ever made. Citizen Kane. My God. Oh, wow. Think of that for the for the parent lottery. Your mother danced in Citizen Kane and your dad starred in his first motion picture, you know, opposite Henry Fonda and John Wayne. I mean, how freaking amazing is that? I know that that's definitely for some stories. Looks like we do have a, a question up for you. Oh, I know that gentleman. It's a friend of mine. Earliest earliest memories of my father's movies. Well, you know, I think David probably knows this story. Uh, but uh, my earliest memory is literally being extremely young. And there's other stories that, of course, you know, when I'm conscious of who he is. But I remember being really young sitting in the living room looking at a giant anybody older than 50 or whatever 40 50 knows looking at a tv the size of a freaking dresser right oh, a yeah. huge tv set and there's my dad and i think it was like maybe perry mason or you know some film and my dad's over in the seat you know in his lounge chair you know uh 1968 69 you're drinking his iced tea and i'm looking yeah. at the tv and there he is on the tv and I'm totally freaked out. Like, I'm just totally, hey, oh, my God, how can you be there and there at the same time? And I, and I remember yes. him very calmly saying, like, especially if I saw something scary as a kid, I always remember very calmly going, well, that's all make believe. It's make believe. Like, you know, don't get freaked out. I don't want you jumping in mom's dad's bed tonight or something. That's oh, make believe. Yeah. But then here I am. I'm looking at him. And it's like, well, what do you mean it's make believe? It's you. You're there. So... That's like, yeah, David, to answer your question, I mean, that's my earliest memory of, of my father of being kind of freaked out like he's on the TV set. That was really bizarre. But, the, mm -hmm. but then, you know, I'm not the brightest bulb on the block or the sharpest tool in the shed, right? But it wasn't too long that I kind of figured out that things were a little different, you know, with, with my father. You can kind of figure that out um, yeah. from just, you know. And I don't know exactly when I became fully conscious, probably around six or seven i'd say i remember that the i remember that the uh, national Enquirer came over to our house we were living in encino i remember the national Enquirer guy coming over and doing a photo shoot with the family and and, and on the lawn of the house and and you know just i remember that and then the article coming out later and i kind of knew that oh wow you know the Enquirer looks at people whether there's some interest in or they're axe murderers or, or something but there was interest in my father. He wasn't an ax murderer, not to my knowledge, but you know, at any rate. Oh, wow. Yeah. So with, with respect to the roles that your dad had, like you said, he was in like amazing films right out of the gate. Uh, and then you saw a stretch, of course, the fifties, they were fascinated by sci-fi and everything. Uh, horror. Did he have a particular fondness for those types of films in that genre? Or was he willing to do anything? Wow. You're a, you're an incredible, you're an incredible interviewer. I mean, let's be honest. Um, if you look at the arc of my father's career and you look at the way that it started and you look at obviously his extremely famous first wife and yeah. the horrible rumors being true or not, whatever, there was no secret in Hollywood. My father did suffer from alcoholism and it's no doubt he drank, but there was some <laughs> definite issues. And I think that when you, when you divorce Shirley Temple in a town that, that deals a lot in not only what you know, but who you know. And I'm not saying that that's like, oh, and we're not whining. My father never played victim. But I think, and then hopefully I'm not going off too far on a tangent, it's like um, those A-list roles started to slide away from my father. And he started to get offered more of these less than you know, these more B type movies, but the irony to that is so, and I think I'm, I hope I'm addressing what you said, but like he loved everything he did. He put his heart into his job, no matter what it was. 
And I right. mean, you can see that throughout his career. And he okay. loved his audience. But the irony, and I hope I'm, I hope I'm <laughs> wrapping this point to what I wanted to say, whereas now they looked at those then of like a, and a you know, this is a G-rated show, but like F that Agar guy, you screw around with Shirley, we're going we're gonna to show him and put him in these Schlockmeister films. But as yeah. time goes on, here we are, it's 2021, and, and you and, and a lot of other wonderful people and groups and film fanatics and fans and everything still love the man and love the work that he did and, and yeah. honor these films. They're, they're like, you know, they're, they're iconic. They're forever. You know, they're cheesy, but they're amazing in so many ways. And so, yeah, yeah. I guess my point is, yeah, there was a time, Scott, where obviously, you know, no, I think it was a, I think it was a dig. I think it was kind of a, you know, a dive, a looked at like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, you're doing schlock films now. But as time goes on, who got the last laugh? I mean, there was enough. Interest, there's enough interest in my father that you're talking to his damn son. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Talking to my, you know, me. And and I always love to say I'm the son of Godzilla. He's Godzilla. <laughs> son of Godzilla ain't shit. Excuse me. I, that's how great my father was. That's how great it was, his legacy, the, the work that he did. You know? Well, I can definitely say, you know, nowadays especially, they, they didn't have access to the World Wide Web and all of the articles and all of the stories that have been written. Um, you know, not, not to get too far into it, but a, a savvy researcher can look at that whole situation and say, that was kind of a bum stick, what happened, you know, to your dad. But I think you're exactly right. That those films, that that the the cult classics, people talk about them. There are whole conventions for them. Some of the other A list actors don't have that. They've kind of gone to into obscurity. And people do love your dad, myself included. Um, his the thing that I loved about his acting is it was, it was very transparent. You know, when you looked at your dad, uh, especially in Revenge of the Creature, which I know inside and out. The realness that he brought to that role, which is one thing that I always love about actors, is the realness. When he smiles, he lights up the camera. You know, when he would be talking, he would command the attention of the audience. So th that was the test of the actor, not the role. You know, like they say, there are no small roles, only small actors. And your dad, no matter what he was in, like we said, all the way through the, the early 2000s, he was a commanding performance you know he was an amazing actor so that's that's very nice like i say i think not you know and listen you'll see a i wanted to i wanted to flip back one second i have to say this because yeah there, it was a different time it was a different place and i just want to say i love robert downey i love his work but just think what that guy did nowadays like he jumped into a child's bedroom but he was freaking high on heroin and mm -hmm. was thrown up all the newspapers and we forgave him and back yeah. then, my father had a DUI and was filmed at uh, on the you know in jail on a on a tractor or something, and it it stuck to him like glue. So yeah. it was a, just just a different time, but yeah. Now, um, nowadays, that would be so tame. Be nothing. It would be exactly. It'd be nothing. But again, I don't think my father held any bitterness or animosity. I mean, I'm saying this like I'm saying it from my point of view, but I never heard my dad come home and he just wasn't like that. My dad just, you know, he never said, Oh, them damn Hollywood. He never he wasn't like that. He was grateful. As a matter of fact, I have to say it again. He just had so much reverence for his fans and he's quoted and it's, it's, you can find it online and, and this is right from him, but he meant it from his heart. This is the thing. He was real. He said, if I gave enjoyment to any one person, I've done my job. It's that well, he did it time and time again. If, if he did it, and no matter what. And I mean, listen, I've sat with him, and I'm not going to, I'm sure the people were dead, but I don't want to back on some of his movies. But he would look at them, they'd pop up on the local affiliate channel at one mm -hmm. in the morning. He'd pop in in his bathrobe and grab a glass of water and see me watching one of these old films, uh, Zontar, the thing from Venus, or something, and go, oh my God. God, you know, what was I thinking? And I go, oh, this is great, man. And he, mm. and it was like, okay. But even on that 
even on some of the ones where you just knew that in the middle of them, I'm sure you could look at the, the dailies or the rushes or just look at the, the tinfoil monster in the corner that just looks terrible to you. Yeah. But like I said, if he had any, if he gave any enjoyment to anybody, man, he was, he was spot on with it. So oh, yeah. that's important. I mean, that's important for me to, to bring that to his legacy because it's so yeah. true. Well, I, I'm so glad that you are such a great ambassador, not only a monster kid ambassador, but an ambassador for your dad. Cause he does have so many fans that love him and, and you can shed a light uh, as to what he was like as a dad and a human. So I, again, I can't thank you enough for coming on. Um, now we touched about the, the fifties and the, sh what would be considered schlock cinema back then. Um, your dad didn't spend much time in makeup and I, I tried finding a photo of this. I remember makeup where his eyes were like blacked out with makeup around them. Do you, you know the one that I'm talking about? I remember seeing it in a book. I know too. Listen, I, I'm not sure. I could only think that maybe that was hand of death. You know, my father played like maybe a walking was. baked potato. So I imagine with the prosthetic that they put on him, they would yeah. have had to have blacked his eyes out. However, there's also a famous, you know, it's famous. They talk about, and I think there's articles on it or something, but the brain from planet Eris, where they put these contact lenses in his eyes that had silver paint in them. And I that, that, was, that could have been it. And one of yeah. them, and by the way, that was, that was Stephen King cites that movie as one of the inspirations to him for the film care or the book Carrie, by the way, which I think is fascinating. But uh, yeah, if you didn't yeah. know that, that's just, and Brain is a bizarre film. For years, they had a show on called Malcolm in the Middle, where they had in the credits a, a picture of a guy whacking the brain with a with an axe, and that was actually a clip from that film, film of my father whacking the brain with an axe. But I digress. Let me go back. the The actual lenses that he had to wear really effed up his eyes, man. They really screwed him up. They screwed him up for years, and you know, I, I don't think there's any scientific evidence to prove it. But who knows? He claims that it could have had long-term lasting effects on his eyesight. So I know that oh, he had I'm sure. So who knows? You know, who knows what they used back then? They used to use asbestos for snow. So yeah. you think about that. So yeah, who knows what kind of crap they were putting in the silver paint back then, right? Yeah, I mean, they, they it has definitely evolved. And, and thank God, I mean, um, one of your dad's predecessors in the uh, universal uh, cache of monsters, Boris Karloff, one of the one of the first that suffered, you know, not to mention Lon Chaney, but Boris Karloff said that he still had those scars on the side of his neck from the bolts. Um, you know, the actors were such wow. and not to not to put anyone down that did it back then, but they were they were treated like cattle. They were told where to go, who to be with, who to spend time with. It was a miracle that they could still perform and do it so well under everything that they had to deal with. It's an art form, right? But it was also a yeah. corporation. It was a, also a business. It was a job, you know, it mm -hmm. was, it was a job. So, but I, I don't think a lot of that, you know, I think that, you know, my father, I think there was, I think later in life he talked about it and he knew the magical time that he lived through. I mean, he, you know, I, I could tell that there was a, <clears throat> there was an embarkation. There was a difference between like, yeah, it was just, it was just a day in the office as opposed to, you know, he knew that other things were, he, I think he knew the impact of mm -hmm. what these films meant to people like the, tr the, the trilogy, man. I mean, the, 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 the universal trilogy, Tarantula, Revenge of the Creature, the Black Lagoon, mm -hmm. which by the way, and I don't mark my words on this or, you know, come back and sue me anybody. But from what I understand, that was like one of the highest grossing films universal had that year and brought them back to life one of many thousands of times they were brought mm -hmm. back to life and then of course the mole people which the mole people yeah. to me is like fascinating because i'm here here's an example that david asked earlier about you know my earliest you know thoughts of film and my dad well i had watched the monsters growing up and i come to find that my father not only was in a movie with butch patrick right mm -hmm. hand of death but he was also in a film with john carradine and john carradine was in the mole people and then later on, I hear this story where, you know, my dad was on set. He's in Universal. He's part of the contract players. So at the same time, they're doing mole people. They're doing a Doris Day film with Rock Hudson on the stage next door. 
and you know the lunch bell rings and you know they all go out and they're at the commissary and they're eating so rock oh, hudson man. comes back to the set of mole people during a break from his shooting with some door city you're probably cited by the years or whatever but it came into the set and the set must have looked insane i mean you look at the film you know the oh yeah silver and and he comes in he says to my i love this story i've told it before but it's like i just heard this recently he comes in, he looks at my dad, he looks at the set and goes, Agar, what the hell you got yourself into here? The hell is this? And I just think that's so, like, so bizarre. That's so, yeah. we think about it, like, what the hell are you into? That it's just it's, another day at the office for them. They have yeah. no idea. This could disappear, you know, for the most part. I think, I don't think these, I don't think the actors enter, they, they must have to some extent, but... Some of them just a thought, well, I'll do this shit. It'll just disappear. It's yeah. just going to go away. They didn't think that it's going to be on DVD Blu-ray with, you know, director or commentary or, you know, whatever right. for years to live on with stills and production stills and whatnot. But, you know, I look at the, I look at the films of this and not only my father, but uh, all the 50 sci-fi and uh, of just part of our national, our heritage, our culture. Mm. Uh, of art and, and of, of Hollywood and art and film, you know? Right. Well, so. you know, the one thing that, uh, and we touched on it a little bit that, that your dad couldn't have possibly known the impact of his career, but you figure the, the films that like, like revenge of the creature that was in 55 and 10 years later would be the, the, the syndication through shock theater, shock cinema, to where this would come into people's homes. All of these monsters, these classic monsters, the original creature, of course, Revenge of the Creature, it was like this explosion less than 10 years after Revenge of the Creature was, was put out. We had this shock cinema, the shock theater, and a new rebirth. That's where basically the idea of the Monster Kid came from because everyone was talking monsters. It was the birth of the monster serial. It was the birth of all of the <laughs> different books on makeup and how it got done. Uh, famous monsters of Filmland. Everything kind of 60s and 70s. That was the time for that B-roll actor that was kind of laughed at in Hollywood. But my God, they were our gods growing up. Exactly. Exactly. And I remember you mentioned the famous monsters. And I remember that magazine. I remember dad being interviewed in it many times and that would be in the house and, you know, in the films and you're right. And like I say, that's, uh, that's, that's my indoctrination as well. And then yeah. I come to find out right. And you know, I wish maybe I'd been more proactive with it growing up, but I mean, I was involved. I had my hand in it with my dad, but you know, like, yeah, I mean, the, the, who would have known? I mean, like I say, I never would have thought, you know, 19 years after his passing that I would, people would even want to talk to me about it, really. Do you know what I mean? I'm fascinated by that. But yeah. uh, but I'm honored to talk about him because it's so damn cool when you think about it. Like I say, just the body of work and just some of the stuff he did. Like, I'm really, I'm really proud. And if anybody ever wants to watch a film and kind of see kind of what my dad was in his older age, I feel mm -hmm. kind of like not totally 100%, but just did kind of, kind of, Spirit, in a way, and I, I don't want to get it, but there's a movie called Miracle Mile that he did in 1989, I believe, with Mare Winningham and Anthony Edwards, and it was directed by a guy named Steve DeJarnay, who did another movie called Cherry 2000 with Melanie Griffith, but, but uh, and I remember meeting him, what a cool guy. But if oh, you watch that film, my father plays the grandfather of Mare Winningham, and it's a, it's a cool sci-fi film, actually, it's about the end of the world, the guy finds out nuclear war is going to hit an hour, and what transpires it's kind of a trip but at any rate there's a partner my old man's at park la brea they filmed at park la brea by the trolley and he's kind of running around with a cane and believe me he wasn't walking with a cane my old man could you know pole vault up until the day he died and dad was healthy as hell but he's kind of a crotchety old man but you kind of get a vibe for just kind of my dad was funny he was just a he was just a lively loving guy he was just funny he was just a cool guy, man. He was just, uh, so if you watch that film, I watch that and it just chokes me up a little because he's playing a role, but I can yeah. so much see my father. I, I see my father in all his roles, actually. You know, it's weird. I mean, it's, you know, you, you everybody that watches his film and watches these films, imagine it from 
and I'm not the only one. Listen, I'm by far not the only son, daughter, or whatever of an actor in the world. But yeah, man, I, I look at my dad and I see him at different places in life. And I think yeah. I've literally been on, I've literally been in the living room and had a TV on in the background and heard something on the TV of my father's voice. And it literally evoked a, what, like, is he, what, wait, whoa. Right. You know what I mean? This is like, I can yeah. totally hear my dad calling me for, get in here, clean up your room or whatever. We get dinners ready or, yeah. you know, it's kind well, of a trick, I, man. I can tell you that that would be a huge blessing because my father passed away so long ago. Sometimes I forget what his voice was like. And that scares me sometimes. Wow. I was uh, I was lucky enough to have an old, you know, the little tiny tapes. Um, he would do notes because he was in, um, you know, an Eastern seaboard manager for Hertz. And he would take little notes on a, a little recorder. That's all I have. But what a blessing to be able to see a movie and hear your dad's voice and see him through different phases of his life. It's like, that's the legacy. And that's probably the most important legacy is that he continues to to get to speak to you in a way. You know, I, I was on a sci-fi group earlier, Universal Sci-Fi Group. I joined it and I said, hey, would you guys mind if I promoted this you know, thing? And somebody, they were so kind. And they said, hey, are you as good looking as your old man? And I thought, God, no, if I was only so blessed. But I like watch, you know, like when I watch my old man in Sands of Iwo Jima or Fort Apache, I'm looking at him, that was like 1949, so he's like 28 years old, oh, yeah. and I'm looking at my father, I'm, I'm sorry, younger people out there, I'm an old man of 56 now, man, I look at him and go, he was just a kid, my yeah. father was just a kid, I'm watching my dad as a yeah. kid, shut up and clean your room. Oh, yeah, hey. That's a trip, and you almost man. wish you could have that back to the future moment where you could actually sit in a bar, sit next to him in the, the coffee shop and just talk to him. That would Big have been time. cool to know what younger dad was probably thinking around those times. Big time. But you know, I've said this before, but I'll say my dad, like literally you look at the timeline and the history, you know, the story of how I got into Hollywood was just, I mean, that's insane. Like, you know, my grandmother was a widow, her, you know, John Agar, the original, <laughs> my grandfather, passes away, leaves her a pretty sizable and, you know, income, you know, amount of money, pretty big mm -hmm. chunk of change. She moves out to Southern California, um, 42 war breaks out, whatever war's already broken out. But my, you know, they move and she buys a house next door to the temple family. I mean, think of this, she was already like America's sweetheart mm -hmm. and temple Shirley temple is like the girl next door. She was best friends. She was friends with my, my dad's sister, Joyce, and they become friends, and there's uh, like a, a tie-in with Oselznik. Oselznik wants to hook mm -hmm. up with my grandma. Just so old, my God, but it's just. But my father was just this simple guy from the Midwest. He was just this guy. You know, just he never, you know, he, he was just sort of thrust upon him, and it's yeah. amazing. Like I say, I, I had an inferior. I still have an inferior to complex. My father, by the time he was 28, was married to America's most famous actress of all time, child actress, and mm -hmm. starred two of the greatest actors in the history of film. And here I am, you know, I, I could never live up to that, but that's okay. I'm the son of Godzilla. He was the man. Yeah. I'm just, yeah. uh, but that's it. You can imagine that. That gave me a lot of, you know, here. I'm going to get the tissue cried out. I mean, that was something I could never live up to. But, you know, my father and mother, they were the supportive parents they were. They yeah. made me feel special in my own right. So, Well, I God bet you, them. even to this day, all they want is for you to be a good person and happy. And all they ever the thing I know, John, uh, we have not talked that often. But the groups that we circle are the same. And one thing that I can tell you is your dad would be very proud because everyone that I have talked to about his legacy and about you, they've said you've been a wonderful person. And I, I can tell just by this interview, your dad would be so proud. So well, thank it's you. not about measuring up to, he's happy. I, I just know it, man. Well, I'm just being me. So hopefully it's not like... But if I if if I was the complete and maybe I am a complete piece of you know what, but if I was in honor of my father, I would do everything in my power to be exactly what 
I would want him to be presented by. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, yeah. and I appreciate yeah. it. I, I don't think I'm a, I don't think I'm that bad of a person. And I am just like you said, the monster kids, the fans, I say this, it's so true. I'm a fan, man. I love that stuff. I, my father, my dad used to drive me to a hobby shop in Studio City, California, right off of Laurel Canyon in Ventura Place, which is right south of, called Kit Craft. And we would go in there and I said, you'll love this, Scott. This is like right up your alley. I, I specifically remember him buying me a uh, model kit for the Creature of the Black Lagoon. I specifically oh, remember him. The old Auroras. And I remember getting the Frankenstein one and him helping me build them. Oh, my you know, God. I specifically remember that. I like to this day. Of course, you know, wow. later in life, I probably put firecrackers in it or something terrible. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I but, think uh, we all did that. Another, at one uh, point. I, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry. Here's another thing I got to say. My father took me to a guy. There was a guy in the, the San Fernando Valley named Johnny Carpenter. And he had a little ranch called Heaven on Earth Ranch. He was an old stuntman from the film. And in yeah. there, he would take care of disabled children, retarded children, you know, Down syndrome. And he'd expose them to, he had a little mock-up Western town. But he had quarter horses that were all trained to do stunt shows. And they could take guns on them. They would be, you know, they. and my father took me as a young man and taught me how to ride and taught me how to shoot guns off of horses. And this is, you know, this is oh. before the 210 freeway. Anybody that knows the valley, when the 210 freeway went through Silmar, this is before it was built. There was a riverbed and he drove, taught me how to sit up in the saddle and how to behave. And, but this is, this is for you. This is an honor of your father, but yeah, that's, you know, that's the kind of daddy was, it was totally cool, but yeah. That's anyway. Fantastic man. So uh, I got to, I got to play with a monster model with, with pops. Yeah. And I got to play with the guns and the Western thing. And I could just tell you, uh, you know, and my old man was just a natural athlete and a hell of a good looking guy. And, you know, if I could be one tenth of what he was, I'd be good. But if, you know, but mostly he had a great heart. He had a great heart and he cared for people and he really appreciated his fans. And you know, what can I well, say? Well, I, I know you, you got to speak with uh, the producer uh, before we started. And she says, and I'm not sure what this is, but she says she's got a photo that might make us laugh. Bring it so on, man. I'd be <laughs> interested to see this. There you go. Beautiful. Oh, oh yes. Awesome. Look at that. That's the Malcolm in the Middle shot I was uh, talking about. Look at that. Look at that inflatable okay. brain. She she definitely earned her, her keep, didn't she? I'd that say she's awesome. a keeper for sure. Yes. And there's oh. and there's my dad's uh, you know, nemesis for that his eyesight. That's the one. Look at that. Yeah, that's like a, that's a contact. It's not even around the eye, Scott. That's like in the friggin' eye. That's crazy. Oh, yeah. And they were probably back then, you know, the, the glass, that would have been extremely painful. Yeah. Suffering what, oh, suffering. here we go. The, the, the walking baked potato. There's a, there's a great band called the Dead Elvi that do a song called John Agar Rules. And in that yes. song, they, they talk about this. At this, they talk about that movie and they talk about Lenny Bruce writing The Rocket Man. And, uh, you know, that's to me, that's amazing. I was a huge fan of the film with Hoffman, Lenny Bruce Lenny. And yeah. I was a fan of Lenny Bruce, even though obviously his setups take 40 minutes now, whereas comedy is yeah. much more lighting, but he was still brilliant for his time. And I got, my God, he wrote a film my dad was in. That's how, how fascinating. You know, the tree uh -huh. and the connections between all the people in Hollywood is, is fascinating. It's unbelievable. So. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So with your dad, with all of the, the stories that you heard, was there a specific movie that, because this will be the homework for all of the monster kids out there. I would love them to take a look <laughs> at this. Tell me what movie your dad particularly was connected with. What one did he like? Out of all the ones that he did, what one spoke to him the most? God, God, you would, you would put me on the spot. I can't, I don't know. I, I, listen, I can tell you growing up that, um, that, that he, that he talked a lot about, um, he did talk a lot about his experience on Revenge of the Creature and he talked about how he'd learned to scuba dive and, you know, yeah. 
he talked about that experience and just just a, he just had a he loved Florida. He had a great um, respect for um, Rico Browning. He talked about Rico all the time. I mean, I knew about Rico Browning before you know whatever. I mean, for years, he he just talked about the the feats of uh, physical prowess and and air holding his breath and just just the amazing work that he did and just uh so i mean yeah but i i don't think uh i mean i can't i can't really spe- you know like i mean he he had stories and you know things he had funny stories and you know good and bad and all i i don't really that's a good question i'll have to think about that even maybe talk to my brother i'm not mm-hmm. sure if there was any specific one that held his heart i know that uh he was pretty proud of, uh, I mean, he was pretty, pretty pleased to, to do Miracle Mile. And I know that he was really excited when he got to do Body Bags with mm. John Carpenter, which was a higher profile made for Showtime series with uh, where he worked directly with Mark Hamill and Twiggy, for, of all things. And, and I, that's one of the later things that I eventually, I was on the set of that. And I got to meet Mark and, and Twiggy and I got to meet... Uh, I think it was David Cronenberg was on that set. And, uh, oh, wow. Um, Roger Corman was in that set. And uh, I got to meet a lot of people. And I'll just tell you that there, there was a, they all had a lot of respect and reverence for my father in a, in a, mm-hmm. in a sort of a, in an honorable way. I was really proud of that. You know, they all had a good thing. But any piece of work, I, I can't think of it. No, I don't think my father ever said, you know, of all the stuff I did, son, that movie blank was the cake yeah i can't i can't think of it you know i, I think he loved i think he loved all the ones that he did it's like you know you just yeah. did the best job he could they're kind of all your, all your kids all your little work babies you know <laughs> exactly exactly you know i uh i i do know that uh um uh I, I do know that, you know, that he was really, um, and he was really gracious with other filmmakers. And I, I tell this story too, but you know, I, I love it now because I'm a great fan and of the history, but I'll never forget one day that I got a phone call on the phone in the house, you know, and I'm, I can't be too old. And I, and somebody picks you know, calls up and says, Hey, is John there? And is your father home? Is John there? I go, yeah, who's calling? He goes, well, tell him it's the producer, Ed Wood. And I put the phone oh. down and I go to my, I go to my mom. I go, mom, there's some guy on the phone. I get the phone covered, you know, the old days. We didn't have. Yes. <laughs> I get the phone covered. I go, mom, hey, that's something I'm thinking. Hey, this is great job for pop. I go, there's some, there's some guy on the phone says he's a producer. And my mom goes, who is it? And she goes, some guy named Ed Wood. And my mother just doubled over, started laughing. Oh. And like, not in a, like, not like, but just, oh, like, oh, the producer, Red Wood. And I gave it to my father. And I remember my dad was on the phone with him for a half hour and he seemed very nice, but, you know, um, he never did anything with Ed. But uh, at any rate, that's like, and I look back on that and go, holy shit, I got to talk to Ed Wood. That's how crazy is that? I had no oh, idea. Yeah. So we're a big, we're a big fan of Ed Wood here in the manor as well with his contributions. I would have loved so. what they would have done together. God knows. I know. I, I do know that, uh, I do know that also it's kind of an ironic, you know, my father was a recovering alcoholic, uh, for mm-hmm. his life. And I do know that some very interesting stories took place. Uh, I won't mention one of them is a, gentleman still alive but my father did a lot of 12 step calls and helped out a lot of actors and now one of them that he had kind of a heartbreak with was a guy named scotty beckett who was one of the original you know little rascals Mm -hmm. but um and i know that something i think that my mother might have alluded to the fact that that ed would call there was more interaction between my father and ed it's my father maybe trying to give the guy a hand up and yeah. Ed just wanted to maybe make some movie or something. I don't know. But at any rate, because it's real life. Listen, just because there, you know, you see them, it's like it's not all a marquee. And you take one in a in a in a walk down a red carpet. It's uh, it's warts mm-hmm. and all. It's the whole business. It's everything in between. It's the it's everything. So right. you know, I got to see a lot of that side as well. But you know, wow, not as not as much as a young man. But as I got older, I got to see a lot more of. Uh, just a and just the kind of casualness of it in the sense that you know it's kind of like 
you kind of know the magnitude of what they're doing. And there was a lot of people I was on the set day, like I was really just impressed by the reverence that, that uh, Mark Hamill had for my dad's work. And I'm thinking, shit, Jesus, man, you're Luke Skywalker. You yes. did three Star Wars, and now look at him now. He's back. He's the yeah. nicest guy ever. But, like, here I was. We sat toe-to-toe -to -toe at a table for 30, 40 minutes at a party at John Carpenter, the director's house up off of Mulholland. And Mark's telling me how cool my old man's pictures were, and he loved the old Universal stuff and everything. How cool is that? Yeah. And at the end of it, I'm just like, wow. But he was just a oh. cool guy at a party. Yeah. Well, I, I tell you, though, that's the thing about your dad's work as well is uh, it was fantastic to watch him in every role that I've seen him in. But the thing is, is that he and others in his genre inspired a whole generation of people to do what we do, whether it's writing horror or like Mark Hamill being in film. That kind of inspiration came from people like your dad. So again, I, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show and sharing some of this. I would love to have you back on again if you're up for it. Maybe we do a, a Father's Day uh, <laughs> with you. Yeah, I'll come on anytime. As long as your audience is not bored to death with my stories, that I'd love to. But yeah, I love talking about my dad and, and old Hollywood and film. Yeah. So absolutely. But it's been a pleasure. I got to tell you, this has been a pleasure. And I hope I illuminated something and, you know, anybody can reach out to me. I answer questions or whatever. I, you know, I, I love talking about my dad. Yeah. You know, I, and I'm well, proud of, I'm very proud of what he did. You know, he, I'm, I'm yes. so proud of my father, but I am really proud of what he did. But, and that's a, that's a great feeling. And I, isn't that the way we keep things alive, right? I mean, we yes. keep things, people, people and things stay alive as long as they're in our hearts and our yeah. minds. And this is a way to honor my father. And uh, if, mm -hmm. like I say, like my dad said, if this gives anybody, if this gives anybody any insider joy or to, to my father or any insight, then good. He, I'm happy too. And I know he would be happy. Yeah. So thank you, Scott. Thank you both so much. Thank everybody so much. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure, sir. Um, and definitely, um, if you want to put in the comments as well, um, John, just the best way for people to get in touch with you, follow you on Facebook or whatever, because I'm sure people would love to see uh, and hear more. But we'll definitely be around June. We'll have you back on, talk about uh, your dad or some good memories again from that. So Anytime. I love your set, man. And you've been so kind and fun. And thank you. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. Well, I thank you to everyone here at The Manor Does. So, uh, And if you'd like to hang on, you get to meet Boris. He's our resident uh, haunt guy here. We don't know what Boris is, so uh, you'll have to help us determine that as well. But if you have to go, we totally understand. But if you'd like I'm to... I'm going to hang out. You, put, you do what you got to do. I'll hang out for the whole show. I'll watch what's going down, man. I love it. But thank you All so righty. much. I'm not All going righty. anywhere. You can blank me out. We'll just be you in the green room. You'll be in the green room, and then we can even wrap up afterwards after we're off the air. You the man. You're in charge of your show. But thank you so much, Scott. It's been a total pleasure, man. I love it. Thank you. All righty. All righty, John. We thank you very much. And without further ado, because I'm sure he's going to have some complaining. Uh, you damn <laughs> right. There, there <laughs> Left out with Mr. Essenzi or Jima. Left out on the wall and have to watch on the phone. You bought us going to kick you in the j jingles. That's what you're going to do. See what I have to deal with here, John? Okay. Here Without further ado, Boris. Another one you locked Boris out for. Boris, do you know what? You let the air out of three of your tires. You're going to guess one, and it reduced the, what, the, the, took the nuts off of one wheel. That Sanzi Ujima, that's the best non-horror movie ever made, ever, Sanzi Ujima. John Agar Jr. made the movie, acted circles around the John Wayne, 
because at the end, John Wayne buys it. He's going to spoil the movie, but tough. It's 1949. Spoilers. Listen, Spoilers. it's 1949. You don't see a stupid movie now <laughs> on you. But the John Wayne <laughs> dirt nap and Agar take the whole squad and, and take Iwo Jima by himself. I'm going to tell you that right now. And by the way, uh, Ed Wood, he was rumored Ed Wood called Mr. Agar for the lead in uh, Plan 9 Out of Space. But he was over, uh, overruled by the Baptist people that financed the movie that wanted their own guy as the hero. So that's, that's the little trivia brought us now. And, you know, that's a good thing. And here she come with the thing. Here the clicky. Go ahead. Is this what you're reviewing this evening? The, yes. Brought us the best movie. It's not horror. But you're going to say the Iwo Jima with the Marines and the far... Tucker, what's Tucker? What's the name from the the? Oh, by the way, the, the disclaimer on the bottom now. So being, you know, the same thing. Whatever Boris say, you're gonna get mad anyway. He got the Facebook. He got the slasher. He got the OnlyFans, but you're not gonna see OnlyFans yet. But you know, you like the Boris. Boris gonna get. Yeah, what you gonna do? It's words. Words hurt you to it. Put some great value piece on your face. The book. What book? The book that we discussed in the email, Boris. Oh, Boris loves that book. So he grabbed this book out of the, the bookcase um, when you guys talking to the living uh, demigod John Agard III. Uh, this is, is the book about horror because you can't do the damn thing about the Agard because, uh, you know, Festa Buffs are over there. We'd let you in if we could trust you because you keep stealing my toys. Yeah, by the way, you lock them up this time. And you change the lock on the door. Boris had the key. Um, this one is, my, is horror movies. Was a part of picture the history of horror movies by Dino Bravo. No, not Dino Bravo. Dennis Grifford. And it's a book. That's Grifford on the back. He didn't look better. That is not good. It could be. Dennis Grifford was a good looking dude. Well, that isn't Dennis if he's dead, he's going to look like this now. But this was a good one. It scared Boris a little, a little bit because when Boris looked over there in the, in the grass... I mean, they got a whole bunch of stuff about Karlov and the monster and monster history. And there's a lot of words. Boris don't like to read, but the pictures are good. See the dragon? For people like the dragon. And there's another dragon. And there's the shadow dragon. But in all serious, this is a good, it's old book, so you may not be able to see it. You have to confess to make a house and steal it or uh, go on the Amazon or find like an old bookstore. And this has a good. Up to about 19, about 80, uh, history of the monsters, both uh, American and, like, European. There's a couple things about, like, Asian vampires in here. And look, here's a, the one about, there's the, the monsters, the, about the culture of the monsters. There's the Herman monster and the Lily monster. We on the Lily monster because she got the Wolfman baby, Matthew Frankenstein. And the Dragon again with the Bun Lou and some other stuff. You can tell Boris just kind of skimmed it. Because again, you know, John Edgar III. No. You round out, I mean, you got like Daniel Roebuck and then Michael Betterman, and then you got John Edgar III. And it's just like, you know, Boris don't want to do homework. And Boris had to do the homework with the fight, but this time he got a mailed in, you know, pawned it in with the book. You have other segments to do, sir. <sighs> okay. You have plugs to do. No, Boris, have... this is all real hair. This no, hair, this is not plugs. No, that's the real hair. Oh, yes. Um, Dr. Peggy's Alligator Pet and Zoo is open again. Um, they didn't find the body, so now it's not the murder. It's the missing person, because when you can't find the bodies, it's a missing person. So go bring the kids. It's uh, spring break, two for one, at Dr. Peggy's Alligator Petting Zoo, and you can feed chickens for 50 cents extra. Um, we got... No, we're, t we're taking you out with us. You you know, uh, the thing next... We're taking week, borders out. Next Sunday. We're, we're, we're taking you on a field trip. You got that email. No, Boris, not <laughs> go out the field trip with you. Boris watched Casino and watched Goodfellas. He's not going nowhere with you because no, you the got the shovels from Murray's House of Shovels. Boris not coming back. Master, sign the release. We have the parental consent. Oh, crap. Oh, no, Zolo. That's right. The Zolo comic yeah. toy show with uh, the Orlando Fairgrounds. Central Florida. Central Florida Fairgrounds. He's nervous right now because they got she got um, a shovel in the the booth. Um, 
Central Florida is 10 to 4, Central Florida Fairgrounds. Go Olo, comic, and toy show. Dot, but not net. They're going to put it up. It's not up there. Haha, ha, you miss it. Yeah. Um, it wasn't up there, maybe. But, you know, that's the show. He, they were so excited about John Nago, they forget to put it up there. But you go to Olo, and they say, just turn Olo, comic, toy show, and they and the Googles, and they pop up, and you say, hey, when is it? And they say, the 28th at the Fairgrounds. And then you say, how much? And they say, well, it's this much. But Boris not going to say because to tell you will be illegal. It's going to be that cheap, but it's going to be good. Quality. Boris going to be there. Fence to make going to be there. And a whole bunch of vendors. So you could go buy back your childhood at, at, at good prices. And then what else we got? Because Boris have to do all these spots because he, that's why they put them at the end. Boris is a commercial man now. Well, we got the announcements of the birthdays. We could do the, the, the wonderful uh, birthdays of horror icons. Oh, we're going to do that now. Sure, why not? Just like Good Morning America. Hello, everybody. We're going to do the birthdays now. All right. Um, Boris is now, what's that guy? The fat man does the smuckers in the Good Morning America, the the, the original. Um, Willard, Scott. Willard Scott. Yeah, this is. The Bozo. This is not. No, he wasn't it was, Bozo. He was Ronald McDonald. Ronald McDonald. That's right. One, one clown. Yeah, one so fat guy. Yeah, was, okay, so this is Willard Boris. Going to do the birthdays. Happy birthday, Brad Dorf. You know, he's a chucky guy. And he was also in one of the Exorcist movies. And he was that uh, grim, grim, grim tongue that uh, wound up messing grim with. Tongue. Grim, grim, grim tongue. Thank you. Uh, he he was in The Lord of the Rings. That's not horror, but, you know, Spence to make a gun be like Grim, grim tongue. Yeah. At least I didn't say them. Warp speed is to get him a worm tongue. And then we got the uh, Alan Tudic or whatever his name is. He was uh, King Candy from the the the... The other movie with the Wrecked Ralphs, and he was in um, Tuck and Dale vs. Evil. That was a good movie. He was also a Leaf on the Wind, but we're not going to spoil that for you. And then Gary Oldman is actually an old man now because he was born the 21st. That's tomorrow. But he's like, he had Dracula with the butt on his head, and he, and he played the guy with like one eye in another movie. And he was like uh, Chief Gordon, Commissioner Gordon. And you done? Not that yeah, they talk behind the camera, so this is boring. They're talking about Darth Maul or Space Malls or so, shopping malls or something. You done? Can Boris, you see, Boris is supposed to shut up, but you two yappy yap behind the camera. And then um, got a new Patreon. Lynn Vincent drank the Kool-Aid, and she new Patreon. Thank you, Lynn. Hopefully, you know, we're going to spend money wisely instead of, you know, like the... Because the, you know that we don't use the budget on shirts. On the, on the fence to make a shirt. You, you show the shirt, everything. He dressed like, you know, Fred Flintstone. Same thing every show. Boris is got like multiples. Because Boris is a bottler, so he got more multiples. But <laughs> Boris just got that obscene gesture. This is the abuse he gets. Because Mr. Man don't want to go to the walls and buy like more shirts. And with the button, you know the button too. You don't even move the button. You could like freeze frame. The button stays because you take the shirt off to hang it up. But next week, you stand up by itself with the Olo. This producer lady changed the you know the glove of punching. Um, do you see that too? Monster Man got the website that's under construction. You know maybe we use Miss Lynn's money for that instead of buying fence making new shirt. Um, he he to like plan. Um, it's Monster Man at thirteen thirteen dot com. It's coming soon. And then uh, we got a couple of deaths. You know it wouldn't be Monster Man when I talk about death. Uh, Parker Yafit Kodo. Uh, passed away on March 15th. Uh, he goes down to heaven to talk about the bonus situation with Brett. And uh, Ian Holm going to go try to probably pull his heart out again to choke him with a magazine or something. But that's the sad. And um, if you remember last show, did you hear the clicky clack of the dog? Um, that was Atlas. Fence to make a dog. And uh, unfortunately, the fence to make a dog uh, move on. Uh, go to doggy heaven. And it, it means old dog, but we love him, and we say goodbye, Atlas. And um, but we do want to thank Murray's House of Shovels because Murray's House of Shovels gave us two shovels: the Earth Mover three thousand and the Earth Mover two thousand to make the hole. And Tammy Emmy, we don't do the pui anymore because she come um, to the funeral and bring nice flowers. So Tammy Emmy, you off the pui list. Um, well, we got the three thing about producer lady since you make borders forget. Um, producer lady so tough she drink magma to fight the heartburn. Uh, producer lady is the only lady in the world to dribble a bowling ball. And, uh, 
Bruce Lee, when God said, let there be light, Bruce Lee, he shut the door and said, you didn't say please. And yeah, we're going to do that. We're going to do that too. But, you know, me, me, Mr. Fink over there, the, the strike border. So then you point. So now we got the new gig. It's called Pui of the Week. Um, you can write in the Master Manor. And if you don't like somebody, somebody did you wrong, uh, we give them Pui. And, you know, like we did with like a couple of weeks with Tammy. I mean, the Pui, we spit on. We don't spit on them. We can spit on their, their property or something. And that's extra, but we're gonna give them a Puy of the week. The Puy of the week this week is the Villages Walmart. The boys had to go shopping in with no cat products because uh, they took out the inventory. Some they had no cat products, couldn't buy the kitty litter. And then um, there's a lot of people. What was that? The hieroglyphic she just hold up about the fence posting. Oh yeah, that too. And boys got the. Um, you know, the one where there's like a lot of old people know, and he, it's more just like old people. It's just not the, the the obnoxious ones that they park the cart in the middle and then they go reaching over him. Boris, like, excuse me. And they say no. So Boris, like, puts some extra in the cart. Like, you have some suppositories. Bloop. And then when they go up to the, the counter, it's like, ta da! What? Well, you got the poop suppositories. You can't go to the bathroom. And the old lady's like, I didn't do that. Well, these you did. Boris says hi. And um, he has a special request for Puy of the Week. He's a fence post little. Um, Hobo Baby, she was really mean to Rotten this week, apparently. You know, she run around the house, not listen to the parents. She's gone now. Um, maybe Georgia or some for a wedding, or the, maybe they leave her there. You know, they're going to leave the baby, which is good, because then there's only, like, two kids left in the house. You can get DCF called on us. That's not both the problem. She's a family wedding. She'll be back. It's a family wedding, yes. Um, yeah. The Pui on the, yeah, Pui on the Walmarts, peoples, and the Pui on uh, the baby. You need to pull you on the fence to make a shirt because you need to really change that. Um, oh, we're going to do... Yeah, what? tell them, tell yeah, them yeah, yeah, the what? great stuff we got coming up in October. Oh, the great stuff we got so coming excited. up in October. Going to get to that. The board has had to, first of all, trying to do this job, and she holding up the sign with the Pui baby and this and that, and then you giving the finger. He's trying, okay? First, second, third, Phantasma Orlando. Phantasma Orlando is first, second, third. It's, it's the uh, really good... Convention after Olo, of course, but the Phantasm Orlando in the Rosen at was it Shingle? Shingle Shingle Creek, Orlando. There's a hotel, big hotel, looking like a castle. Look up for the spot we're gonna do it now. It's like a big castle. You could go live on the website and rent the room. Um, we can't tell you because they got a special deal. But look on the the Phantasm Orlando set uh, website and you can see a wonderful uh, hotel deal. What does feel like? Um, what the heck is that? The uh, Johnny Olsen at the end of uh, mm. Magic Game telling everybody about like you know the coffee maker you win with all these stupid spots. Well, you are wearing your Botany Five Hundred suit, so that's that. This 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 Botany Five Hundred is from like the host. It's not the the, the voice. At least you wear the suit, not just the regular old shirt with the thing in the button. Mm. So what else we got not up there? The voice. What? Voice from the control room. Oh, the control room, right? Yeah, the, the voice of evil coming out. I don't even have one of those. No, because you can't be trusted with one of them. Yeah. Um, what else? Um, I think that's about it for this week. That's it. We got the pools out the way. We got this thing. Um, whole new guest lineup to announce uh, in the coming week. Yeah, eventually you're going to tell Boris who who come in, but uh, next week is nobody. So that gives you time to uh, save your pennies and go to the Olo collected uh, comic and uh, whatever you know the comic and toy show. You know by now you you heard Boris talk about the five hundred times. You know go to comic toy show, buy a ticket, go buy stuff. Stop by me, Boris gonna be there. You see producer lady, you get to see maybe the great value piece we bring with the you know the Boris used for the punch bag face, and you can stop by and say fence to make it. Oh look, you got the same shirt on for the convention. That's nice. So yeah, I'll do that just to tick you off now. Listen, Boris. So nice. Do you think he pissed Boris? Or you think of Boris off? No, Boris dress nice, clean clothes. He gonna wear stinky stand up clothes. That's on They him. are clean. Yeah, well, Fabrice don't count as the clean. Professionally clean, clean every week. We have a washing machine and dryer. You saw it when you broke in through the side door of our house. Yeah, but the kid that does the washing and drying leaves the stuff in the washer and then go out for the weekend and then you take it out of a full stink. So, yeah, you're going to need to wash and dry your child. So, now he do the Yahoo, which means, you, yay, we got to end it, of course, because Boris has been rambling. Because, again, he's in shock of Mr. Agar. 
and then you know once they get a good guest on Boris all semblance all the breakdown because you know Boris is second hand thought but but changes will come so next week we got nobody two weeks we're gonna have somebody he's gonna drag up or you know call up say hey when to come on the show they say yeah and then Boris get told 10 minutes before I gotta make promo so what is gonna guess um somebody in horror pretty good guess that's good maybe Boris be the guest you know Boris come out so do that and then the, you gotta have Boris as a guest Boris in horror Boris live horror his life is horrible since he met you. And oh, by the way, Pui and the extra Pui on Defense of Burgers for cutting his butt off last week with the rant because Boris watched the show last oh, week. Oh. And all of a sudden he's like, hey, and you talk about it and the black may go off. Power. What do you got to Cut me off again. Son of a...